And Rasulullah foretold that by stating that a time shall come upon the people that everyone will be consuming a riba. What is a riba? Usually. And those who do not consume a riba will be afflicted by its dust. A hadith narrated by Imam Abu Dawood. This has never occurred in human history that the entire globe is consumed in a riba. A riba has that effect on the markets and the prices that even the depleting of natural resources and minerals in places like Africa and South America is caused by a riba. Someone may say, how? You have organizations like the IMF and the World Bank that when they loan that money to countries, they have strings attached which entails higher taxes in those countries. When the people are overtaxed, they resort to crime. Some of them will go to poaching, like we hear about the poaching of elephants or the tusks of a rhino. This is all a result of poverty and greed. And then we hear about the deforestation in South America, all caused by high inflation and the riba, interest-based banking. They refer to it as interest, but the classical term is usury, a riba. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has waged war against the riba. So the, the result of a riba is such that those countries are affected to the point that some countries will over farm the land. What that leads to is erosion of the soil. When you over farm the same land again and again, it leads to erosion of the soil. Erosion of the soil leads to bad crops. The crops fail. When the crops fail, it leads to high prices because there is no local crops, no local wheat, no local barley. They need to import everything. And when you increase imports, that increases the prices. Sometimes imports are cheap because some countries will overproduce. And when they have surplus, they send that surplus out to other countries for cheap. That also harms an economy. How does that harm an economy? It harms the economy because the local farmers then cannot sell their produce because cheap imports are coming in. But in the Akhir Zaman, the proliferation of a riba is one of the main reasons for what inflation. This is why the inflation today is different to the inflation hundreds of years ago. The inflation hundreds of years ago would have had its own reasons. But the inflation today, why your gas prices have gone high, why your electric prices have gone high, is different to inflation decades ago even. So, from the Shiratu Sa'a, from the signs of the end of times, is high costs and the, the failing of the markets to the point that when the markets fail, this affects countries and it affects them in such a way that recently, for instance, Pakistan took 200 million for what they refer to as gender rights. Now, they took 200 million for gender rights. This even led the television channel ARY Digital to make a clip to promote LGBT rights in Pakistan or an understanding of LGBT. But why would a country like Pakistan feel the essential need to do so? It is because it is under debt. Why is that country under debt? It is under debt because that country has taken interest-based loans, usually based loans, loans from the IMF to the point that the interest is so great that the mathematical numerical value of the interest 
becomes almost impossible to pay back. This even happened to the Ottoman Caliphate from the time of a Sultan Mahmud II. That was the cause of the downfall of the Ottoman Caliphate. In 1839 he passed away, but in that time he took interest-based or usury-based loans. That led, it was a spiral effect, it led to the downfall of the Ottoman Caliphate all the way up to 1908, when, at the removal of Sultan Abdul Hamid the second Rahimullah, and then in 1924, where you had the formal abolition of the Caliphate, that was a series of events that was caused by interest-based usury. The loans were taken to construct a railway from Vienna all the way to Istanbul, to make a seven-day journey into a 48-hour journey. To take, to construct that railway, interest-based loans were taken. When they were unable to pay off the loans, this led to many of the Tanzimat, the reforms within Ottoman law, which included the abolition of the jizya tax on the minorities and the Christians and the Jews. The abolishment of the jizya led to revolt on the part of the minorities because the jizya protected them. The jizya protects the Christians and the Jews because it's a small tax. And in response to that tax, the caliphate protects them. But when the tax was abolished, higher taxes were placed on the people. A Western-style bureaucratic system was superimposed upon the populations of the Islamic Caliphate, which led to its eventual downfall. A bureaucratic system that initially the land belonged to the Khalifa. What does that mean? It belongs to the people. Because the Baytul Mal, the land is the, under the ownership of the Baytul Mal and the beneficiaries of the land of the people. But when the law was changed to a Western democratic style law, this meant that private ownership is superimposed on the population. Private ownership means that people are free to do what they want, which includes exploitation. So the world that we live in today is exploited. We live in a world of exploitation. How even the house that you own is not really your own house because you own the structure that is built and constructed over the land. The land actually be belongs to the queen or the king. The monarchy itself is just a construct, uh, a name for the system that governs everything. But even for the house that you buy, when you purchase a house and mortgage, you are not actually purchasing the land that the house is constructed upon. Because the land belongs to the government. You are paying for the structure that is made of the land. And you are given house deeds. But even that is enslavement. Because a man or a woman will spend 30 to 40 years in some cases paying off their mortgage. By the time their mortgage is paid off, they become so old that they cannot even enjoy the house. And then in many cases, because the young children are placed in Western style education, where they are not taught that you do not place your parents in old people's homes. They are not taught other and manners. They are not taught how to treat elderly people. So what do they do? They place the elderly people in old people's homes. So a man who all his life he works to pay off his interest-based mortgage, at the end when he reaches old age, he ends up in an old people's home. So he is in enslavement from the very beginning to the end. This is how people in even so-called Western democracies are enslaved because the enslavement is not only in the mines of South Africa 
where people go into the mines and they dig for gold for corporations or dig for diamonds, blood diamonds for corporations. The enslavement is not only for the man in India who pulls a rickshaw, an entire cart with passengers on the back only for a few rupees, while Moody makes the plans to send people on the moon, you have over 300 million people still needing toilets in India. Enslavement is not only in those regions. Enslavement is not only in the region of China where people work in iPhone factories. And when they feel depressed after having worked for over 18 hours in a dark environment, they feel depressed and they jump out the windows. And the factories place nets, so they land on the nets. Enslavement is not only in China. Enslavement is also in Western democracies where people are rid ridden with debt from birth till death. You are born with debt and you die with debt. This is why freedom of so many places is not an easy issue. People wonder why places cannot become free and independent like Kashmir or Palestine. Why can they not become free and independent? The answer is if they became independent states, that would mean a portion of the debt is removed from those countries. Who will pay off the debt of India if all of Kashmir is freed? The fraction of people who are paying off the Indian debt, they will be gone. They will, or if they are in, annexed to Pakistan, then they will be paying Pakistan's debt. Because the entire globe is what? Debt ridden today. The entire globe has debt. Sometimes some people are so naive, they see a country that is constructing tall buildings like the UAE and they think this is progression. They do not realize how much debt that country is taking on. How much money are they loaning? And the money in fact is only a paper currency with no intrinsic value. A paper currency, not gold and silver. And they pay the same money back to Western corporations, Western construction companies to come and construct those buildings. Using a slave labor force from Pakistan, India and Bangladesh or African countries to come and construct those buildings. And they may enjoy some years of prosperity, prosperity through haram, but eventually the debt needs to pay, be paid off. And the debt, when it's paid off, the taxes are increased in that country. So high living expenses today are a result of a paper currency, a paper currency that is superimposed on the entire world. You have paper currencies in every nation. The currency has no intrinsic value. And then the proliferation of riba, that every country is debt ridden with a riba. And then of course there are many other factors. One of those factors is war. War increases debt, but war makes certain people rich. This is why even the Ukrainian war is profit making for the same people. People who make profit from both sides. There are people today who are making profit from Russia and they are making profit from the West. They are profiteering from the war. This is why the war is continued. This is why the war is allowed and permitted to continue. Because some people, bankers, are increasing their profits from both sides. Weapon manufacturers, fact, manufacturers they are increasing their profits. Those who manufacture weapons, they sell weapons to both sides. So, the war in Ukraine is a repeat of history. Every so often you have a war. Why is war so common? To the point that even in 2003 when Iraq was invaded, millions of people protested against the invasion of Iraq. But if we are living in a real democratic world, in the Western world, if the Western world was really democratic, the policy of war making was not democratic. People do not want war. The public does not want war. Yet they entered the war. 
and people profiteered from the war. So profiteering from war also increases debt for nations because today, if you look at the list of nations that are under debt, I think Pakistan is number three at the moment. Even though Pakistan has never had a real war, they've had those incidents with India, but a real war, meaning conquering Kashmir, uh, would entail a real war, but they will never do that. Because then it decreases the value of the army once the Kashmir issue is settled. If Kashmir is settled, then it devalues the value of the army. You look at the, the Pakistani army today, every general or the son of a general or every soldier will have free education, but the citizens do not have free education. Why? Because the army is valued because they sustain the military. The military is a machine, the mega machine must be maintained. Likewise, every nation today has a mega machine. Russia has a mega machine. China has a mega machine. America is a mega machine. The, the greatest mega machine. And then NATO itself is a mega machine. Each one competing to construct its mega machine for dominance. And then you may have a nexus of machines which is known as the UN. A, the UN, a vacuous body which has a sterile body which has no real implementation of its policy, no real implementation. But the continuing war is profiteering, but it brings down it brings down nations, but it increases the inflation. So today we wonder why our gas and electric is going up. It's going up because we've had unnecessary lockdowns during COVID, unnecessary lockdowns. If you remember when the Ukraine war started, if you jog your memories, do not have short-term memory. As soon as the Ukraine war started, the lockdowns finished, and as if to say COVID-19 disappeared. This is not to buy into any so-called conspiracy theories, but to mention a fact that the lockdowns themselves were what? A policy of governments, but not an absolute necessity. That necessity was done away with as soon as the Ukraine war started. So the Ukraine war led to high prices, but also the lockdowns because people were not free to, cut, to trade and commerce amongst themselves. It led to higher prices. And today the war in Ukraine is being sustained, maintained for a long period of time. Why so? Uh, people can profiteer and the prices increase, they surge. So our gas prices are surging, the prices of wheat and barley have increased in many places. Why? Because Russia and Ukraine were the main exporters in the world. Let me make a point with regard to this. With regard to export, why is Ukraine and Russia exporting the wheat? to the rest of the world. Can the rest of the world not grow its own wheat? The answer is yes, nations can grow their own wheat. But, and this is the blind followers of certain political parties in Pakistan should listen to this point, that when you become a part of the international economic community, they impose conditions what are those conditions? Some of those conditions are that you cannot grow certain things, you must import certain things, those same things. Why? To benefit the member nations. So a nation may be told you cannot grow your own wheat and barley even though you can. You must import so the other nation benefits. And you must grow something else. So this is why now the Muslims are suffering. People who think it's absolutely essential for Pakistan to take IMF loans or to become a part of the trading union, the, tra the trade unions that they have, or the organisations that gather various nations for economic purposes, that limits the development of Pakistan, not increases the development. 
How does it limit the country is told you cannot grow certain things and then they must import certain things. And then when a war like this happens, like the war in Ukraine, the country suffers. So today the countries are suffering because they do not follow the regulations of Islam. They follow the regulations of a bureaucratic democracy, a so-called democracy. So this is with regard to the cost of living crisis, which people ask about why are the, the prices of food increasing. These are some of the reasons. Why are the prices of gas and electric going up? These are some of the, the reasons. And these things are from Ashrat al signs of the end of times. Many years ago, I mentioned to people that they must invest in gold. At that time, there's some people, critics, detractors, made a mockery saying, why is he informing people to invest in gold? He should tell people to invest in cryptocurrency. Now, if you look at the price of gold from many years ago, you will realize why I was mentioning that people should invest in gold. Cryptocurrency is a scam. How is it a scam? Only a small percentage of the people who invest in cryptocurrency actually benefit. The overwhelming majority of people are losing money. So if someone invested £10,000 and they did not remove their £10,000 investment in time, the value of their cryptocurrency has gone down. They have lost much of the £10,000. In the 1980s, there were pyramid schemes. The only difference between cryptocurrency and pyramid schemes is that cryptocurrency is a digital version of pyramid schemes. So, instead of investing in cryptocurrency, people became greedy because with gold you have to wait. With cryptocurrency, they thought it is quick money. Whenever you hear about quick money, money that you do not need to work for, there is a golden rule. What is that golden rule? That it is tr too good to be true. That when you hear about quick money schemes, remember it's too good to be true. So people became greedy and they invested in cryptocurrency. But now those same people, they are crying with regard to cryptocurrency. They have lost out. So investment in gold was one thing. Another thing to invest in was silver. Silver is ch still cheap, relatively speaking. But a third thing which I mentioned was farming land. That people must invest in farming lands. And I also mentioned that communities can buy farming land. If everyone in this world placed in a pot 5,000 pounds per family, and as an organization, we bought a farming land from which everyone can benefit with organic milk, organic wheat and barley. Sometimes people boast that certain nations are able to increase their produce. But they do not realize those countries are increasing their produce through genetically modified foods. So in Pakistan today, because Pakistan is accepting any advice that the West gives them, they accept. They do not grow organic food. So they have abandoned old style farming. Farming according to the traditional method. What does that lead to? If you had a, a produce grown on a farm through organic means, you will smell the fragrance of that produce. Like onions, for instance. Uh, onions have no fragrance, but you can still smell the onion if it's organic. The people who go to Pakistan today will tell you that so many vegetables that they grow now, you cut them, you cannot even smell the vegetables. You cannot even smell the fruit. Why? Because they are bringing in genetically modified means of farming. But that harms the soil in the long run. It harms the land in the long run. These things are harmful in the long run. 
So even farming by investing in farmland, when you invest in farmland, you are in the long run able to grow so many things, vegetables and fruits, even here in England. That we as Muslims, if we invest in farmlands, in fact, even if every masjid had an organization like that, do you have a debt committee in this masjid? Yes? Do you have a debt committee? Yes. Yes? Imagine your masjid opened a land committee for the people who pray here and you bought farmland here and the land goes under the trust of the masjid what will that lead to benefiting when you have your molid and the food will come from the farm imagine this you have a farm and whenever you have the, the milk coming from the farm, the wheat coming from the farm, the rice, even if you are able to grow rice, but whatever you are able to grow, it comes from the farm and it comes into the masjid as a what? Every masjid or huge masjid like this, mashallah, can afford farmland. This is one way to avoid the harmful effects of inflation today. This is something that the trustees of this masjid, the trustees of all the masjids in the UK, of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah, they should keep in mind that if our big masjid had farmland, then they could farm their own lands and bring in produce. If, if we are afflicted with times of difficulty, our masjid can even provide basics for the people. And this is a mind child of mine that people should uh, look into. So, I mentioned gold, silver and farmland. That these are the investments that people should do. But instead of hoarding paper money, the hoards of paper money that we have, it should go into something that will benefit the Muslims in the long run. Then, with regard to, this was... Uh, what was mentioned in the subject was cost of living prices and inflation. This intertwines with modern schooling. Modern schooling today has become an issue and will become a greater issue in the near future. So many people, our ancestors have been saying from the 1940s and the 1950s when they first came here, that one day we will go back to Pakistan. Now over 70 years have gone and we have not gone back to Pakistan. And Pakistan has caught up in corruption with the West. So whether you live in Pakistan or India, or whether you live in Bangladesh, or the United States, or in Europe, or in Britain, the world has become a global village. In this global village, people are now poisoned through a modern education system. During the British Raj, the Western education system was the preserve of an elite. So only certain people went to Western schools and became indoctrinated with Chaucer and Oscar Wilde and whoever else they read in these schools. So the general popul population was not infected by this way of thinking. But the elite, they would go to these schools. You just need to look at Blavad Bhutto, for instance, a produce of the Western system. Likewise, Throughout the post-colonial world, you had people who were elitists, who were educated in the West. But now, the entire globe has been enveloped by what? State education, and in many cases, Western-style state education. That the propaganda is not limited to news, television news. 
people switch on the television, they do not realize the news that they watch. So whether you watch BBC, which currently has taken action on Gary Lineker for his comments on the British policy regarding migrants crossing the channel, but the same BBC corporation did not take action on Gary Lineker for his comments on Qatar, or whether you watch Geo News, whichever virus of television you watch, your mind will be infected with propaganda. Whether it's state propaganda or whether it's corporate media propaganda, your vision of the world is shaped by the media that you watch. And even if you read newspapers, the newspapers will be a produce of the ownership. Whoever owns the newspapers, the news will always be slanted. But then you have the state education to further indoctrinate people. So we send our children from 8 a.m. they wake up and they spend a minimum of eight hours a day in school. Eight hours a day, one third of the time. Then one third of the, the time they sleep and then one third of the time they may spend on social media and on the smartphone for the not so smart people. The smartphone which has changed the zeitgeist which has changed the paradigm of the modern mind. So they go to school and then they are indoctrinated with many things. When in reality, the number of years you spend in school from the age of six up to the age of 16, 10 years of schooling, and then you have a few years of nursery, so we will say 12 years of schooling, Many children leave those schools and they do not even have a skill. They do not even have a skill set. These schools do not teach grammar. They do not teach rhetoric. They do not teach logic. These are essential tools. Many people who come from Pakistan, who have studied English in Pakistan, they are shocked when they realize the state schools here do not even teach grammar. So a child, a child born in an inner city area is already disadvantaged. He has no advantage over people who go to private schools. He goes to a school which does not instruct him in grammar, in rhetoric, in logic, and then they are taught useless facts. Facts that will never be utilized. You will learn information which you will only retain momentarily, but then you will forget later. Like so many of you who read history in school, they teach you about Arthur Young and his land reforms, or William Cobbett and his land reforms, but you do not know what application that has in our daily lives in terms of economy and how that affected Britain. So many of us will learn things in school that we will never apply in real life. But today, the education system is worse than what it was in previous times. Now there are multiple choice questions in the exam papers. They have dumbed down education to the point that man is relying on the machine to write. So, so many of them will have ineligible writing. They will not be able to write with neat handwriting. Look at the difference between handwriting of this generation, the current generation, and the previous generation. The previous generation could write letters with the ink pen. Today, young people cannot even write a straight line because they rely on the laptop. Or they even use these phones as if to say that the phone is educating them in school. So the machine is now educating the human. The organism is being educated by its invention. The as I said, states are a machine 
the education now is given by a machine and it was further increased during the lockdown where people were listening to one another on machines as if to say a gadget will instruct you in your education but then it gets worse why does it get worse because aside from confusing your mind with machines they confuse your gender also some of you are told that you are not even men and then you behave like women and women are told they are not women and then they behave like men and some people are told they are neither so it's the modern form of the eunuch castrated men and in between a symbiotic generation a generation that's a confusion between male and female they cannot even know whether they are male or female that's the type of age we live in young people are indoctrinated and brainwashed in schools but at the same time there is a double speak eric blair known as george orwell had a concept known as double speak in 1984 is this 1984 a curriculum book today in schools how many of you study george orwell in school put your hands up please george orwell in school did you cover him in school not a single hand 1984 double speak double speak is such a thing that they tell you you have the right to exercise your freedom of speech but when you enter the classroom animal farm enters and what happens if you exercise your freedom of speech you are told to be silent or be silenced you are reported to the headmaster if you say sir i do not believe homosexuality is permissible sir i do not believe what you are teaching me is correct it undermines my religion it undermines the bible the entire english nation is constructed upon the church of england and the church is the teachings of jesus christ upon whom be peace and jesus christ was a a person who instructed us in the teachings of Allah of God almighty like Musa alayhi salam Moses and Moses and Jesus they both both taught us that homosexuality is an abomination that there are only two genders male and female yes there are some people born as hermaphrodites but if a man is born as a male he will always remain a male If a woman is born as a female she will always remain a female but today young people are indoctrinated in these schools and then they are bombarded with algorithms on the internet to the point that even youtube children has now an algorithm that targets young children children as young as this are targeted are bombarded with algorithms to brainwash them into thinking that these young boys are in fact women or girls or the young girls are males so they are not only bombarded in schools they are bombarded on the internet through algorithms they are bombarded with advertisement because shaitan when he was outcasted when he was sent out from the heavens what did he say i will attack them from the right and the left and the front and the back the only area that was left was the sky or the ground so advertisement hasn't reached the skies at the moment and advertisement hasn't reached the ground and we hope to allah and pray to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that it never reaches the sky but people are bombarded now with billboards attempting to brainwash young children so this schooling system it leads to what moral relativity it le- leads to what 
a virus of the mind known as atheism and secularism. What is moral relativity? Do not confuse it with Einstein's relativity. Moral relativity is what? Is that depending in the age and place that you live in, morality and ethics change, which is absurd. So if you go from one place of the world to another, in Amsterdam today they have legal prostitution, but in Britain it's illegal. In China they may eat the fetus, a human fetus, they can purchase the human fetus and eat the human fetus. In some countries they can utilize an aborted fetus for makeup, genetics of the aborted fetus for makeup. This is moral relativity to the point that Richard Dawkins even likens the human fetus to a, the fetus of a swine because he's an atheist. They have no fixed morality, no fixed virtue, different to Al-Islam. In Al-Islam, your morality is fixed. Murder is always wrong. Injustice is always injustice. Theft will always be prohibited. Adultery will always be prohibited. Eating, cannibalism would always be prohibited. But the school, modern school education system has led to moral relativism and the confused mind. So this young man or young woman, they leave school, they do not know whether they are male or female, and then on top of that, they do not know whether God exists or not, and then they also live with moral relativism. They are unsure about everything. At one point, they may believe incest is permitted, as Lawrence Krauss stated. The physicist is uh, now an uh, outcasted Arizonian physicist, meaning in Arizona University. He was outcasted for sexual harassment. But he's a person who said that incest could be permitted. Based on what? Because he is a produce of moral relativism. So do not be surprised when you see these type of thoughts filter down to the masses to the point that when you see someone taking a light stance on many issues, for instance, with regard to the aggression of the occupying state of Israel, they take a stance where they may permit Zionism as a valid philosophy. This is only a result of the school education system, the totalitarian brainwashing that they have undergone, no different to the brainwashing camps in China. The only difference is that it's a sweet prison here, even though you are born with debt. So widespread immodesty, widespread immodesty is only a result of a poor education system. The education system has bombarded the mind so much that many people, or the overwhelming majority of them, are a produce of the education system. Even though there is no real education, so many people say they are literate. When they do statistics, they state Britain is 100% literate. If that were the case, you only need to go down to certain areas and listen to people when they read a paragraph, they are unable to read correctly. This is why the Sun newspaper is so famous. Why do you think so? Because the headline is bigger than the actual article. The headline will cover the majority of the page and the article itself will be a paragraph. A paragraph as if someone has written it by text message. And this is known as journalism. The working classes imbibe this newspaper, they do not read The Economist or other newspapers. They read this particular newspaper. So, widespread immodesty is a result of the education system. And as I said, the education system produces, if it does not produce literate people, and it does not produce illiterate people, it produces semi-literate people. 
A true literate person is a person who can not only read and write, but he is actively reading and writing. Actively reading and writing. You compare the levels of reading amongst the middle classes with the working classes and you will see a disparity in terms of reading and educating themselves. So therefore, the widespread immorality is a result of a confused mind. And then you have something which is a result of that also, which is what? Mindless scrolling. What is mindless scrolling? Scrolling on the final day. In previous times, in previous times, when people were more pious, they would scroll on the Sibha. The scroll on the Sibha, and then with the influx of two things, the influx of Western thought, and this illiteracy, and the influx of Wahhabism, it led to people abandoning the Sibha and Dikrullah. The Wahhabis, they say the, the, the Dikrullah gatherings are a bid'ah. So people abandoned the Sibha and they adopted the smartphone. And then they are semi literate and they spend all day on this. So the Wahhabi police force, Tokimada's police force of the Spanish Inquisition, the Wahhabi version of that, when they stop people from Sibha and they stop people from Dhikrullah and gatherings of Dhikrullah, then they do not see the influx of the smartphone that instead of Dhikrullah, people are spending their time on what? On the smartphone, which I said is made for the not so smart people. That they need to always go on the smartphone to entertain their minds. This is also a result of the education system. Similarly, Islamic illiteracy. What do I mean by Islamic illiteracy? That today, if someone is illiterate in the dunya, it is not as harmful in all cases as him being illiterate in the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Knowing Al-Qur'an al kareem and the Sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Islamic illiteracy. This is why the Wahhabis and the Shia have been able to misguide so many people. Because when the Wahhabis mention a hadith and a person is illiterate, he will not know the true implications of the hadith. And Wahhabism is simplistic. It's what simplistic in what sense that it is literalism. Wahhabism is all literalism, taking things on face value. This is why you notice people who did not do so good in school, they will always gravitate towards Wahhabism because Wahhabism keeps everything simple. You just read a verse of the Quran. Mind you, they are as stupid as those people who blind follow beads. That's another form of ignorance, blind following beads. Another form of ignorance. This is why in the illiterate areas of Pakistan today, you have these false beads with such a mass following. They will have huge following. But those people are illiterate Islamically. They have no literacy in Quran and Sunnah. And this is why it's absolutely essential for Muslims now to increase the literacy of the Quran and the Sunnah. To increase their learning of the Quran, the meanings of Al-Quran al kareem and the Sunnah of Rasulullah which is the Ahadith of Rasulullah Wherever you will have illiteracy, you will have the clash between the Wahhabis and the people who follow Jahil Beers. Why do you have this clash? Because both of them have a symbiotic 
relationship the house can the the house can the 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 one that lives of the house which is what is how if you have for instance a mosquito it drinks blood from the host it needs that so a jahil peer will always maintain a following by refuting wahhabis and the wahhabis will maintain a living by refuting the jahil peer but if you had the correct understanding of quran and sunnah neither group will exist neither group will exist that remember one thing the wahhabis may quote quran and sunnah but they have no understanding of the quran and sunnah because we have the imams the salaf salihun but the jahil peer he will not even quote quran and sunnah he will tell his followers to blindly follow him this is islamic illiteracy and then sometimes you have even the shia entering how they will enter a region they will quote an odd event and when they will quote an odd event uh, or an odd narration they will confuse the masses and make them shia why because of islamic illiteracy in this final segment of my lecture i want to mention how do we counter islamic illiteracy which is the most important thing how we counter islamic illiteracy is by increasing the circles of knowledge increasing the circles of knowledge every masjid should have firstly a course for tajweed al quran for adults and children tajweed al quran when you teach something like tuhfat al atfal or al muqaddimat al jazariya additionally every masjid must have a free arabic language course now some muslims they always complain they say how should we pay these teachers if we have so many millions to construct buildings we also have the means to pay the teachers so every masjid must have what language courses arabic language why arabic i'll tell you why arabic most of us here are from the from al hind bilad al hind our children will not know urdu my children will not know urdu if you go to the generation after this generation they will not even know urdu they will not know bahari they will not know any of their original language but they will know english but to maintain islam you do not need to maintain your culture you need to maintain your deen because islam enters every culture but how do you maintain your deen through the arabic language there are people today who undermine arabic I'll give you an example when you look at the words of Imam Ahmad Al-Ghafan rahimahullah 100 years ago when he wrote in the Arabic language there was a sheikh called a Sheikh Abdul Qadir Al-Tarabisi his son Ahmad who was a scholar of Al-Madinah Al-Munawwara moved to India after reading the Arabic words of Imam Ahmad Al-Ghafan rahimahullah he stayed with him that they say the historians today in al-madina say we never heard of him since he left what happened to him why was that because of the arabic language when you do not maintain arabic you lose islam arabic language because arabic language is the language of al-quran al-karim and the sunnah of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam Arabic language is not only for Arabs because even many of the Arabs cannot speak correct Arabic what did the colonialists attempt to do they when they entered the khilafa they divided the arabic nations into various nations then what they attempted to do 
is to divide the Arabs by dividing them linguistically through the colloquial Arabic. So they said Morocco has its own Arabic, Syria has its own Arabic, Iraq has its own Arabic, so we will count these as different languages. Why did they do this to disunite the Arabs? But many of the Arabs were intelligent. Like Saddam Hussein, in this regard, was intelligent. It doesn't mean I condone him in everything, but in this regard, he was intelligent. He maintained Fusha. He maintained the Arabic grammar in his schools. And similarly, there were other Arab nationalists, they made, for other motives, which was Arab nationalism, but they maintained Al Fusha, which kept all the Arab nations united. But I say, not for nationalism, not for Arab nationalism, but for Al Islam, that we unite what is known as Pan Islamism. The entire Muslim world is united through Arabic. Therefore, it's not essential to preserve Farsi. Who speaks Farsi now from us? Even though Farsi was the language of the courts in Mughal Hind. We were governed by the Mughals, they spoke in Farsi. We do not speak Farsi. But Arabic language will always remain. And this is why when they formed Pakistan, the first mistake that they made was to make Urdu the national language. In reality, if they made Arabic the national language, two generations later, the entire Pakistan would be conversant in Arabic and maintain the language of the Quran. So every masjid must have an Arabic language course. Thirdly, every masjid must have teaching of what? Al-Qur'an wa Sunnah. Teaching of Al-Qur'an wa Sunnah. Have one dars al-Qur'an weekly, instructing the people on the Qur'an. One dars of Mishkat al-Musabih, instructing people on the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Learning the hadith. And this is how you will revive Islam and establish Islam not only in this country, but globally. Because Islam is a global religion. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to enable us to counter the forces of globalization with Al Islam and the truth of Al Islam. MashaAllah, everyone says, SubhanAllah, please. Everyone says, MashaAllah. Okay, now we've got a few minutes uh, for Q&A, inshaAllah. So the brothers that have questions, if you can please come to this side uh, with your questions, and inshaAllah we will ask uh, the Shaykh for his guidance in uh, whatever it is that you may want to ask about. I, knew, I know there was a few brothers that wanted to ask any questions, and there were also some brothers that uh, were personally invited by the Shaykh to ask questions about whatever issues they may have with the Sheikh uh, or uh, you know whatever they are you know speaking about online. So if you have any questions from the Sheikh, it's an open mic. You can come and discuss any of your problems, any of your issues uh, with the Sheikh, and I'm sure he will reply to any of your 40 questions. I think there were uh, or more. And the other brothers that have uh, questions uh, regarding uh, this topic, you are also welcome, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum as Sheikh, you mentioned in this lecture and some uh, previous ones as well, where you refer to the schooling system as an institution of brainwashing. Can you expand and um, explain why you refer, uh, refer to it as an institution of brainwashing? So, a better word would be the system of indoctrination and thought reform. So, a mo more precise description would be thought reform. Thought reform is when you enter an institution, they reform the way you think and do not leave you to autodidactic learning, which is self-learning, which is what Islam does. Islam instructs. Islam doesn't thought reform. put you through the process of thought reform. It instructs you and guides you. So a brainwashing means what? Thought reform. Anyone else? 
for a question? Brother, this is a golden opportunity to ask the Sheikh any of your questions. So if you have any questions, please do come forward. The sisters, there's a number upstairs. If you have a question, you can message on that number and inshallah I will ask you a question to the Sheikh as well. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Sheikh. My question is, what is the role and duties of the parents for the kids in today's society and how can, how can parents who are not knowledgeable on the deen help raise and nurture their kids in today's challenging times? The most important duty of the parents is to give their children time. When you do not give your children time, then do not expect the local Mulvi to reform him when he's past the age of 20. So they say, oh, my son doesn't listen to me. Where were you for your son when he was 8 years old, when he was 10 years old, when he was 12 years old? If you are not accompanying your children for most of the time, then who will give tarbiyah to your children, the television, social media and school? You need to fill in that time with your own personal time. So if you cannot homeschool, at least listen to them on a daily basis on what they have been, what information have they been receiving in schools to deprogram them with regard to the school code reform. This is absolutely essential. Chef, there's a question that we have received um, in regards to Islamic schools or homeschooling. Which one would you advise? And for Islamic schools, what steps can we take because the community is apparently not interested uh, and you know they don't show any uh, intent for Islamic schools. So how can we establish Islamic schools? What's their importance? And do you uh, recommend Islamic schools or homeschooling? So I would recommend firstly homeschooling, but not everyone is able to undertake the arduous task of homeschooling. It's very difficult. You must give many hours. But if we establish schools, as I mentioned, mosques have the initiative of buying land for farming projects. Mosques can also be a springboard for a project to open schools. We have so many mosques now that demolish the old building and build a new masjid for 2 million, 3 million, 5 million. That is sufficient amount of money to open a school. So this comes down to initiative. If you do not have initiative, you will never carry out these projects. My job is only to plant the seed in the mind. It's your job now to nurture the seed and for the plant to grow. So you need initiative and a dedication to open local schools for the local children. Another thing that local massage can do is opening tutoring in the masjid. So let's say, legally you do not need to send your school, the children to school. You do not need to register your children in schools. What's essential by law is that your t children are being taught at home. And it's not even essential to teach them the syllabus, the curriculum. It's essential that they are educated individuals. So if you do not send your children to school, then you can set up tutorials in the masjid. How? You can have educated people coming into the masjid to teach math, science and English. And the people pay a fee of £20 a week. So if I can afford £20 a week, I pay £20 a week. And the children, instead of going to the schools, they go to the masjid to learn math, science and English. This setup can also be done. Inshallah, people like you with the initiative, when you have good men like him, 
running the masjid. Inshallah, you guys will have the initiative and you can set up one. If you cannot set up a school, then you set up the tutorials for people so they do not need to send their children to school. They can send them to the masjid. A fee can be allocated, something affordable, like 20 pounds. Imagine you had 100 children, 20 pounds a week from each child, and if they cannot afford 20, you can give some type of uh, redeemable price for the people who cannot afford. Inshallah ta'ala, when you have initiative, where there is a will, there is a way. Uh, just to let the brothers know that, inshallah, I mean, we are planning, and hopefully, uh, whatever the Shaykh has mentioned, we will put that into practice, inshallah, to protect our future generations from indoctrination and from brainwashing that is taking place in schools, inshallah, hopefully with the help of the committee and the entire community. It takes the entire community to raise children, and inshallah, that is uh, in place as well. Just a final question from a young brother here, and then inshallah, we will conclude and go towards the Isha prayer, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sheikh, you mentioned in the lecture of yours that the modern day currency or economic system is a bubble waiting to burst and it's unsustainable and the country should return to gold and silver uh, coins as currency. If ever, when do you think this bubble will burst? And also, do you, are there any books you can recommend in relation to this topic? Firstly, I do not have the prescient power of predicting the future, unlike some peers who claim to know the future. But I can analyze things according to my own abilities, but I will not ever say when something may occur. But I would want to mention something that someone said to me prior to this lecture. They said, tone down your English when you speak because we have children in the audience. I said, that the children in the audience understand me very well. And you are a clear demonstration of that. And there are many of the children here that understand me very well. And they understand the message that is being conveyed, inshaAllah ta'ala. With regard to books, there are many books you can read on this. But before going on to the recommendation of books, Winston Churchill, you know Winston Churchill, the man on the five-hand note, who was uh, a well-known colonialist, and he referred to the Sufis in Sudan as rabid dogs. Why? Because when the Sufis launched jihad in 1898 in Sudan, Winston Churchill went to Sudan as a journalist. And he, and he described the Sufis as rabid dogs because they were launching jihad against colonialism. This Winston Churchill, an imperialist, he attempted to restore gold currency for Britain in 1925. But it was a failure. And he was opposed by John Maynard Keynes, Keynes, the famous economist. But those reasons could be cited today by people to say why we should not reinstate the gold currency. But inshallah, I will refute that some other time with regard to why it failed in the time of Winston Churchill, post World War I. With regard to literature, there are many books. There is one book written recently by a man named Sebag, S-E-B-A-G, a non-Muslim, on the natural economy. It's a small book, very beneficial. You do an Amazon search, you'll find the book. But there are books written by Muslim authors as well, like Taik al Diwani. He has a book, The Problem with Usury. I read that book when I was about your age. How do you know? Yes, so when I was about your age, I read a book similar to that. That actual book. It's called The Problem with Usually by Tariq al Diwani. This is the book I started with. But later on, many of the ulama, they pointed out the problem with the gold currency. But start with that book, inshallah. Dara. And soon there will be a book of mine released on this also, inshallah. inshallah.